story that's been of intense interest to a city where being Irish means something. When Boston College announced in March that it was returning all records from an ill-fated oral history project, it was hoped that would be the end of it. But not in Northern Ireland, where memories are long and grudges smolder. That's what Boston Globe columnist Kevin Cullen saw firsthand during his recent trip to Belfast and reported in this Sunday's Boston Globe. Kevin joins me in a moment, but first, a reminder of how things got to this point. The idea seemed benign enough. Interview former militants as part of a historical archive of the sectarian violence that roiled Northern Ireland. Over five years, Boston College researchers collected some 40 interviews, all under the promise of confidentiality. But in 2011, the federal government forced Boston College to hand over some of the interviews to British authorities, who were investigating the 1972 murder of Jean McConville. Facing the prospect of turning over more interviews, BC decided to return everything to the participants. So what was the reaction when these documents showed up on doorsteps in Ireland? Boston Globe columnist Kevin Cullen is here, fresh from his latest trip to Ireland. First, this is a story with a lot of layers, so I yeah. just want to go back a little bit to the, the origin of it. A former journalist, uh, Ed Maloney, uh, got together with a former IRA guy, Anthony McIntyre, and he was going to conduct the interviews mm -hmm. of former IRA people for Boston College. What was the intent? I think the, the, the idea was that in the heady days after the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, which more or less ended the troubles as we know them, that they would get combatants together and interview them and have them explain why they did what they did and what they thought of what they did. And the idea was to preserve this for posterity. Um, what changed is that in 2010, Ed Maloney wrote a book in which he signaled that he actually had interviewed. They had interviews. Boston College had interviews of these people. And eventually the police said, we're going to get this stuff. They specifically wanted to get things on the Jean McConville murder. It was a horrible murder. A woman in 1972, a, a widowed mother of 10. Mm. And she was abducted, murdered, and secretly buried by the IRA. Now, that was what the police initially went after. Now they say they want everything. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you got there, I mean, we knew that these tapes were going to be returned. Mm -hmm. They were subpoenaed and Boston College complied, essentially, even though they, 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 they claim they tried to resist at first. You went over there. What did you find was the reaction once these tapes started arriving? Well, I mean, uh, you know, so I talked to some people who did not want to be quoted on the record. You know, some people are getting their tapes back. Some people are, don't know what to do. Uh, I know one specific case, a guy named Ricky O'Rourke, he actually burned them. And uh, when I, I didn't put this in the story because it just didn't fit, but I said, Ricky, if I put that in the paper, you might be held in contempt of court. You did put it in. No, not this part. When oh. I said that to Ricky, I said, mm -hmm. are you sure? I said, that's, you know, that could be construed mm -hmm. as contempt of court. And he said, I am in contempt of this court. He said they shouldn't have had my, my recollections. They were, they were recorded for posterity, mm -hmm. not, for, not for the police and not for the British government to dissemble. So you, you saw this graffiti around mm -hmm. Belfast that said Boston College, College touts. touts. What does that mean? A tout is the local idiom for informer. And it's probably the most provocative, loaded term in the local idiom. When you call somebody a tout, there are generally consequences for it. Uh, over the, throughout the Troubles, um, Touts were routinely found on roadsides with their heads and hoods, mm. um, their hands tied behind their back, and they were discarded. And they were, they were put there as a message to other people to keep them from informing. So when you call somebody a tout in Northern Ireland, you are in some cases putting a target on their back. And so these fellows feel that they have been targeted, that people are calling them touts because they gave their recollections to BC. Okay, you just mentioned Ricky O'Rod. Mm -hmm. He was one of the people. Right. And how was he reacting now? Well, first of all, he's, you know, he feels like he was betrayed. He feels like he went in there and did not expect his stuff to come out until he died. Uh, but he's worried. He is worried. And the interesting thing about that, what I found is that, that the B.C. situation is almost a microcosm of the problem in Northern Ireland in general. They don't know how to handle the legacy of the troubles. And who gets to tell the story is very important. One thing I did come away from it, everybody has trashed the whole B.C. project. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, you know, biased because Ed Maloney and Anthony McIntyre don't like Jerry Adams, which is true. 
But the other thing I found, these IRA guys that gave their, te- you know, gave their accounts, they feel that this is the only way their story gets out mm-hmm. because they are not in the mainstream of Irish Republican thought anymore. They kind of push to the side because they oppose the way the peace came about. They don't want to go back to war. They don't support any of the dissidents who are using violence now. But what they said is what we fought for was not worth for what we settled for. You also talked to a guy named Tommy Gorman. Mm -hmm. What what was his story? Tommy is 69 years old. He's a well-known IRA activist. He spent 13 years in prison. He escaped from prison twice. He's sort of what you would call an all-star IRA man in that that milieu. Now, he has been totally ostracized by the mainstream Republican movement because he's very critical of them. He thinks that that settling for the compromise that they did, which is basically to recognize the partition of Ireland, and to engage in what he would say is the opposite of what an Irish Republican stood for, which is you don't support, you cannot ever tolerate the partition of the country. And, you, and he also basically said, I fought for a socialist republic. This is not a socialist republic. All right. So do either of these guys, Ricky O'Raw or Tommy Gorman, feel like they're going to be a target? Well, I asked, I, I mean, I literally asked Tommy Gorman, I said, Tommy, are you worried about getting arrested? And he said, no, I'm worried about getting shot. And not by my erstwhile enemies, but by my erstwhile comrades. That's the sort of temperature f- that I felt on the ground there. There were people very concerned. And I'll tell you, I talked to another other guys that did that they don't want to be identified because they're afraid that they would be identified as touts. And like I said, you put that, that graffiti was up all over. I was surprised. There were six or seven spe- separate ones that I saw. I probably missed some. But it's out there. And when people get called a tout in Northern Ireland, that is literally putting a target on somebody's back. It's, it's, it's criminal that this has fallen apart. But the, the, the journalist and the skeptic in me thinks somebody's got to make duplicates of this stuff. The transcripts, definitely there, there've got to be duplicates because McIntyre was doing the transcripts and then sending them encrypted emails to Ed Maloney at mm-hmm. BC. So he must have them. Somebody's got to I have don't them. know. I honestly can't tell you about that, Emily. But I get put it this way. If I was one of the interviewees, I'd be very concerned about the possibility of duplicates, whether the government still has things, whether Judge Young still has copies of these things, who knows? BC? It's very hard to account for where all this stuff is now. It's just, like I said, the, the sad thing is I think that this, this, the whole project was well-intentioned, mm-hmm. and I think if it had stayed under seal for 30-odd years or so, it would have been a valuable contribution to history. But right now, it's sort of a, it's, it's sort of a blueprint of how not to do projects like this. I mean, did the Irish police really believe the only way to go after this McConville murder, I mean, it's, what, 30, 40, 40 years, years 40 old, years. was to open up these tapes because Jerry Adams had been a, a suspect in the past. It wasn't well, like sure. I mean, th- this is the, the the other thing I tried to point out in the story is the hypocrisy of the police involved because they go after Jerry Adams. It j- just so happens to be the leader of the largest nationalist party in Northern Ireland, and they don't go after anybody else. I mean, there. Are, if you go through that archive, I assume you would find something that would implicate the police in collusion. Now, at the very moment that the police are demanding Boston College to give up their archive, the police in Northern Ireland are refusing to turn over their own records to the police ombudsman in Northern Ireland, who wants to investigate some 60 murders in which police and military officials from Britain were involved in extrajudicial killings, in which all their informants were almost like the Whitey Bulger story. They had all their informants involved in a lot of these cases, and they were protecting informants, and informants were getting people killed. So it's a murky thing, and that's the whole problem about Northern Ireland. They, they, don't know how to rec- they don't know how to reconcile their past. They don't know how to, and, and they're fighting over who gets to say it. But, but I mean, the, the, the larger the community, you know, are they still focused on this, or have most people kind of moved past it? They don't want to start the war. No, and I, and I don't think that, I mean, I, I do think if Jerry Adams is charged, I mean, he was questioned, but yeah. he was not charged. If he, he is, if he does face charges and nobody else faces mm-hmm. charges That'll as a result a of this, I think that's a real political mm-hmm. problem. All right. Kevin Cullen, as always.